So we are going to talk about Sophia. Sophia, who is the most Gnostic and most famous of Gnostic goddesses. And we're going to talk about Sophia. I love this picture of her. Sophia uh, in three ways, symbolically, mythically, and philosophically. Symbolically, Sophia is this inner sense of loss. <coughs> An inner sense of longing to fulfill ourselves. It is the loss of our true identity. We are somehow feeling that we are more powerful than we are. And this is equally uh, important for both women and men. Sophia, it's the same thing for both women and men, which means we know that somehow we are not fulfilled, that somehow we are not reaching our potential, and we don't know why. What is this limitation? What are these limitations? Why are we somehow unfulfilled? So she's both a sense of loss, of what is truly important within our own being, within our own soul, which cannot be fulfilled by material goods, or ambition, or fame, and the desire for this fulfillment. So this is what she symbolically represents. A sense that somehow we are caught up in this three-dimensional world, and we know that we are more, but there are just so many limitations, and we just don't know how to break away. And I think this is a good starting point for our workshop later. You know, what are these limitations? What is this longing? And it could be different and probably is different for different people, right? Because it's very personal. What is this limitation, you know? What is this longing? Or perhaps what is this desire, you know? So the sense of loss and the desire to transcend this, you know, to manifest ourselves in a full glory, like this, like in this poem, you know. Gnostics love the narratives, so they love telling stories. So mythically, and it's a little bit Gnostic, uh, Gnostic cosmology here included as well. So as you remember, I was talking about Protenoia, and she, it sta it, she started to create the world from our different universes and the world when she came out of Pleroma, right? She's the active sort of element of creation. So she was enjoying this creation, and she was thinking, wow, she, I created already a few universes, been in this dimension, been in that dimension. Wouldn't it be really fun to check how it is to be embodied? How, it be, uh, how would it be to be a physical being? And she just, out of fun of creation, embodied. So she became a physical human being, just for fun of it, just to check how it feels. And then she realized she can't get out. Not only she can't get out, okay, and suddenly this multi-dimensional being is in three dimensions, not only she can't, uh, can't uh, get out, and I'm oversimplifying just for the sake of the workshop, right? Not only she can't get out, she starts to forget who she is. She starts to forget that who she is. She starts to forget that she was a divine being, and in fact, she still is a divine being. She's just living in a limited world. And as Gnostics say, and it, it's a metaphor, which is very important, she forgot to this point of view, to this degree that she actually starts to prostitute herself. So some people take it literally that she actually starts to prostitute herself because she doesn't know how to earn a living. And actually this is why later on prostitution is also thrown at Mary Magdalene, which is actually a metaphor, which has nothing to do with actual being a prostitute. But even more importantly, mythically, it means that living in a material world, and Gnostics were like that, it is a form of prostitution because you forget that you're divine being. You think that your life, and I think that my life is about, uh, I, I, I don't know, being a famous professor, having a BMW, living in a right suburb, and there's nothing wrong with this. But if you think that this is your identity, you prostitute yourself, Gnostics would say. Because your soul is greater than that. Because you have a divine being within you. It's okay to have external things, but if you identify with them, if you think that this is who you are, these positions, 
uh, this um, material goods, you know, living in the right suburb, having a Jaguar, I don't know, Tesla, it's pretty cool actually, <laughs> and so on, then you prostitute yourself because you forget that you're actually a divine being. So it's okay to have these things, but if you think that these things uh, represent you, that this is all you are, it's a form of spiritual prostitution. And there's another one called Simon the Magician, or Simon Magus. He's actually mentioned in the Orthodox Bible, but in very negative terms, because he was considered a, a rival to Jesus, hmm? because he was also very popular. And uh, he believed he, that uh, his partner, Helena, was the personification of Sophia. So he was writing a lot about Sophia. And he believed that she was also the incarnation of uh, Helen of Troy, the beautiful Helen. Okay? And later Gnostics said that this is who Mary Magdalene was in Jesus' life. That she was the representation of Sophia, the divine wisdom, in Jesus' life. So there are two parallel teachers, Simon the Magician, who is a historical figure like Jesus, and his partner Helena, whom he believed was a... a personification of Sophia, embodiment of Sophia, and that Mary Magdalene was the embodiment of Sophia in Jesus' life. And uh, I, I don't have time to talk about it now. I spoke about it in my previous talk for the Carlion Society. We know now that it was a historical and scriptural mistake that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute, right? So I just don't want to cover it now. I just want to mention that that's a complete fiction and even that the Catholic Church admitted to it. Now, philosophically, who is Sophia? So let's start with modern days, intuition. So Sophia is intuition in your life. So Sophia is this other quiet, voice of your soul that very often goes against your rational mind, which says, no, 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 this is dangerous, that's too risky, don't go there, don't do it, right? And Sophia, or the intuition would say, well, maybe it's not good for you, but maybe it's good for your soul, you know what I mean? Maybe this risk is necessary. This is this quiet voice, and it's quite interesting, one teacher told me, spiritual teacher, it always speaks very quietly. It's the ego that screams. <laughs> right? It speaks quietly. So sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish this quiet, subtle voice. In theological terms, Sophia may be called grace also. You know, when you feel completely united with, with the divine. In Hinduism, the equivalent of Sophia is the buddhi. The buddhi means the, the higher mind, but it's not the rational mind, it is the mind that goes beyond your rational mind, the higher mind that has the ability to connect with the divine, the buddhi, right? Not the rational mind, it's the mind above the mind, like you know, on the top of your chakra, so to speak, the mind that can connect with the divine. But it's a different mind than the rational mind, which is the mind of survival, right? Then also in Orthodox Christianity, we also have this concept by the most Orthodox of all saints and teachers, Thomas Aquinas, who came up with the idea of intellection. Intellection is exactly what Gnostics believe Sophia was. Intellection is this immediate ability to grasp God's wisdom. Like when you just know it, and it's true. You, you just know it. And it's a higher knowledge. you suddenly are completely connected. And you know that this connection is true. So it's intellection. Or in Zen Buddhism, it could be called like Satori. You know, like, ah, you have this, yeah. Right? So it's intellection. For, um, for Gnostics, it was Nus. Nus was the, like a hook on top of your top chakra that was hooking to the silence of God or to the mind of God. So it's basically the same. Nus. Just, you somehow are one with the silence of God. But it's not your regular mind, right? And it is within you, they said. We just, 
It's just too loud. We are too loud. But it's within you. That's, a, that's why you have to look within. Worshipping ain't enough, the Gnostics would say. You have to get in touch with this. And it's quite interesting because, you know, originally, and in Greek originally, we had Father, Son, and Sophia, Holy Wisdom. And Sophia is feminine. And as it was translated into Latin, and lots of great far, uh, church fathers, on which I did my master's degree, had a terrible Greek. Okay, so they sometimes didn't know what they were translating. They translated into Spiritus Sanctus, the Holy Spirit, and suddenly something beautiful and feminine in the Holy Trinity was lost, and we got this neutered Spiritus Sanctus that even as a child, when I was going to church, you know, I was raised, raised as a Catholic, it was Father, Son, and Spiritus Sanctus, you know, what's that? So this feminine third part is missing. It's Sophia. It was translated, Sophia was translated into Spiritus Sanctus, the Holy Spirit. So every time you make a decision, you contribute either to evolution of the universe or devolution of the universe. If you make a decision based on your fears, on materialism, on your doubt, on lower emotions, on guilt, you push the universe into darkness. Every time you overcome your fears, make a decision from higher emotion, such as compassion, or even faith, you move the, the world, the whole universe, the whole cosmos moves in a different direction. So it's, it's moving all the time between darkness and light. And we are the creatures in the middle, so it is up to us. So we are absolutely the most important in this.